here I've got a nice problem from the 2003 Silk Road Math Olympiad. And what I like about this problem is that in our solution, which is adapted from the official solution, we will see the appearance of two very important functions. And these two important functions do not clearly appear by the statement of the problem. Okay, let's look at the statement of the problem. So we'll first define this subset of natural numbers A as all numbers of the form m to the n as m and n ranges over all natural numbers bigger than or equal to 2. And then our goal is to find the sum of all numbers that are 1 over k minus 1 as k runs through the values from A. So to get an idea for what A looks like, I've cooked up the following chart. So obviously this is just a partial chart. You could fill in many more details if you wanted to explore the contents of A a little bit more deeply. So what do we got? Well, I have my values of M running along this top row, my values of N running along this leftmost column, and then in the middle of this chart in yellow, I have the values M to the N. So notice here we've got two to the two, here we have three to the two, four to the two, five to the two, six to the two. And then in here we have two cubed, three cubed, four cubed, five cubed, six cubed, and so on and so forth. Now maybe one of the most important things to notice is that some numbers appear twice on the chart, but they will only appear once in this set just because of how sets are constructed. So for instance, this number 16 appears as two to the fourth power, and it appears as four to the second power. Furthermore, this number 64 will appear as four cubed. It'll also appear as two to the six, and then it'll also appear as eight squared, but that's a little further down here. So suffice it to say, on this chart, we have overcounted some of the elements from A. So when we throw out all of the double counting, A contains elements of this form. So let's see if we can put them slightly in order just based on what we see here. So we've got 4, 8, 9, 16, and then next is uh, 25 maybe, and then next is 27, and then next is probably 32, so on and so forth. So we're adding not the reciprocal of all of these numbers, but we're adding the reciprocal of one less than all of these numbers. So the sum that we're looking for is one over three plus one over seven plus one over eight plus one over 15, and then so on and so forth. Okay, now that we've got a feel for how this is going, let's clean up the board and jump into the solution. Okay, so hopefully that exploration gave you a nice intuition for what the elements from A look like. Now we're ready to look at a solution. So I've written my goal sum right here. So the sum over all values from A, K, one over K minus one. Okay, so this one over K minus one almost looks like the sum of the geometric series, but not quite. Recall that the sum of the geometric series will have the form the starting term over 1 minus the common ratio. Now, this doesn't exactly have that form, especially because that common ratio is generally less than 1. Okay, so let's see what we can do to make that in this form. Well, what if we just factor a k out of the denominator? So that's going to give us the sum as k goes over all elements from a of 1 over k times 1 over 1 minus 1 over k. And now what we have created right here looks a lot like the sum of a geometric series. Well, since that looks like the sum of a geometric series, maybe we should really dive into what the parts of this geometric series are. We'll notice our starting term, which is generally denoted by A, is 1, and our common ratio is 1 over K. So that gives us some motivation for how to rewrite this yellow boxed term as a sum itself. So now we'll have this sum as k goes over all values from a of 1 over k, 
And then inside of that sum, we'll have the sum as L goes from zero up to infinity of one over K to the L. But now I'll re-index this and manipulate it so that we can work with it a little bit more easily. So I'm gonna change my starting point from L equals zero to L equals one. And I can do that if I subtract one from the exponent here. So that's still adding the same numbers, just re-indexed. Now I can maybe multiply this one over K through, and instead of having a sum within a sum, I'll have a double sum. So here I've got this sum as K goes over all elements from A, and then the sum as L goes from one up to infinity of one over K to the L. So you might say, well, where did the L minus one go? Well, notice I've got a one here, which will combine with the L minus one to give me L using exponent rules. Now I'm gonna write this in a little bit of a tricky way, but I really think it's the best strategy in order to figure out how to calculate this sum. So I'm gonna write this as the sum, as r goes from one up to infinity of a sub r over r, where a sub r counts the number of ways that r can be expressed in this form k to the l. So let's write that down. We've got a to the r is the size of the following set. So I'll write this as the number of elements in the following set. So we've got tuples kl such that k is in a and then l is a natural number because it can go from one to infinity. It can be any natural number. And then furthermore, k to the l equals r. So that's the set that we're counting up. And that's kind of the weight that we, get the, that we give this one over r term. Now, as some simplifying notation, I'm gonna take this set which we're counting up and give it a name. And the name that I'll give this set is a sub r. So that means that our little a sub r is really the number of elements in our set a sub r. So I wanna point out that most of the values a sub r are equal to zero because there's a big restriction here. Not a lot of numbers can be written in the form k to the l where k comes from a and l is a natural number. Okay, so what's our goal at this point? Our goal will be to count this number a sub r differently in a way that we can rewrite this sum as something that's maybe immediately and obviously summable. Okay, so let's maybe bring the necessary information to the top and we'll move on to the next step. On the last board, we took our goal sum and we rewrote it as the sum as r goes from one to infinity of a sub r over r, where a sub r was the number of elements in this like crazily constructed set. Now we're gonna look at the question, how large is a sub r? so that maybe we can express it as a little bit simpler of a set. Well, let's first suppose that we've got an a sub r which is non-zero and take that number r. So in other words, we're gonna suppose that r is equal to k to the l, where k is an element from a and l is bigger than or equal to one. Next, we're gonna factor r using its prime factorization. So this is by the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. So we can write r as p1 to the alpha one times p2 to the alpha two, all the way up to pu to the alpha u, where all of these pi's are distinct primes. And then these are the weights that we need for the prime, these exponents here. Okay. So next, we'll consider the following number. I'll call it alpha, which will be the greatest common divisor of all of these exponents. So this is gonna be alpha one, alpha two, all the way up to alpha u. Then if we do that, we can take each of these exponents and write it as a multiple of alpha. Well, that's really the definition of the GCD. Okay, so let's do that. So we've got alpha i is equal to alpha times beta i. And then here we're gonna do that for all i between one and u. Now let's see what we've got for r. So now we can take r and rewrite it as p1 to the alpha times beta one, 
P2 to the alpha times beta 2 all the way up to PU to the alpha times beta U. But notice we can factor an alpha out of every term in the exponent. And then by exponent rules, we can write this as P1 to the beta 1 all the way up to PU to the beta U all to the power alpha. And then next, I'm gonna collapse all of these numbers right here into the number m. So that means I've got my r written as m to the alpha. And then you can check here that m will be necessarily bigger than or equal to two. So we're getting to the point where we're expressing r in the form k to the l again, but then counting up the number of ways it can be expressed as k to the l, which is like exactly what we wanna do here. But now we wanna see how many different ways can we write this as something to some power. Well, let's notice for special values of n, we can write this as m to the alpha over n all to the nth power where that alpha over n is a natural number. So now notice in order to be able to do this, we need n to divide alpha. So in other words, n is a divisor of alpha. But next up, in order for this to be a version of r written in k, we need that larger exponent to be bigger than or equal to two. In other words, we want this n to be bigger than or equal to two. So that means our condition is that n divides alpha and n is bigger than or equal to two. Well, that means n can be any divisor of alpha except for the number one. So this boils down this question to counting the number of divisors of this number alpha and then subtracting one because we're not allowed to use the divisor one. Well, luckily there's a well-known function that we can use to write this down easily and that brings us to our first important function. So just to reiterate here, how many choices are there for n? There are exactly tau of alpha minus one choices for n. And so what is tau of alpha? This is the number of divisors of alpha. And why minus one? Because by our setup involving the definition of A, we're not allowed to use the divisor, which is equal to one. Okay, great. So let's maybe summarize some of that up here and then we'll move on to the next step. Okay, on the last board, we discovered that our number A sub R was defined as follows. It was tau of alpha minus one, where alpha was equal to the GCD of alpha one up to alpha U where those alpha one up to alpha u were the exponents in the prime factorization of r. So let's maybe give a couple of examples of this, just so that we have a feel for what's going on here. So let's let r, for instance, equal to five first. So if we've got r is equal to five, well, notice that's just five to the one. So that means my alpha is really just equal to one. But that's pretty clear. But now our a sub five will be equal to one minus one, which is zero. So we're not adding anything that's of the form one over five. Okay, let's look at a little bit more interesting of an example. Let's say r is equal to 36. So notice 36 is two squared times three squared. So alpha will be the GCD of two with two. In other words, it will be equal to two. That's because those are the exponents here. So that means a sub 36 will be equal to two minus one or one. So we do get to use the number one over 36. So let's maybe look at 27. So if you've got r equals 27, well notice that's three cubed. That means alpha is equal to three because we don't need to take the GCD with anything. But that means a sub 27 will be three minus one, which is equal to two. Okay, and now you can continue to play this game, but I'll let you guys play around with it if you need to. Okay, so now that we've got a feel for this number a sub r, let's jump into the end of this problem. Okay, now we're ready to finish off this problem, but I'm gonna do a little bit of a cheat here and leave the next step for homework. But that's because it's very, very similar to how we calculated the number a sub r. 
So here what we want to do is define a number b sub r, which is the number of elements in the following set. So it's the number of tuples m comma n, where m and n are bigger than or equal to 2, and r is equal to m to the n power. And then you want to show that b to the r is equal to tau of alpha minus 1, where alpha is defined just as it is up here. So the proof here is almost exactly the same as the proof here. That's why I don't really want to go over it. Okay, so now let's see what we can do from there. That means we can rewrite this as our sum, as r goes from 1 up to infinity of b sub r over r, given that a sub r and b sub r are the same. But now, by the way that b sub r is defined, it's pretty easy to write this as a double sum involving these indices m and n. So that's exactly what we'll do. We'll write this as the sum as m goes from 2 up to infinity, and then the sum as n goes from 2 up to infinity of 1 over m to the n. But now we can notice that this guy right here is a geometric series. So let's see. It's a geometric series. What's our starting term? So our starting term is m squared. Well, that's in the denominator, so it's really 1 over m squared. And then our common ratio is 1 over m. So that's r, our common ratio. So that means we can sum that pretty easily. That's going to give us this sum as m goes from 2 up to infinity of 1 over m squared over 1 minus 1 over m. So starting term over common ratio. Okay, now let's do a little bit of algebraic, algebraic manipulation on this. Maybe we will multiply the numerator and the denominator by m squared. That'll give me this sum as m goes from 2 up to infinity of 1 over m squared minus m. And then from there, we can do a nice partial fraction decomposition on the sum and here and write this as 1 over m minus 1 minus 1 over m. Given that the denominator factors as m times m minus 1, it's a rational function. So that should motivate you to attack this in a similar way that you would do for a similar integral. So like I said, partial fraction decomposition. And that will turn this into a telescoping series. And so I'll let you guys work out all of the details. This is like a standard kind of trick at the end of a problem like this. So this will telescope down to just the number one. So in order to do this carefully, you need to write it as maybe the limit of a partial sum and then collapse that partial sum. But just to do it maybe quickly, you would notice that this turns into one minus half plus one half minus third plus one third minus one fourth and then that continues on forever and that's by this decomposition of our sum here so notice we've got the one over m minus one term first and the one over m term second but now we can see that this half will cancel with this half this third will cancel with this third this fourth will cancel with something that's coming later and so in the end all of this adds up just to the number one. Okay, so that's our final answer. This value here is just the number one. Now let's look back at this remark, and I said that two important functions would appear. But at the moment, I only see the appearance of a single important function, and that would be this tau of a function, this number of divisors function. So where is the other important function? Well, it turns out that it's right here. And you might say, well, what is going on here? Well, if we change the order of summation here, this turns out to be the sum as n goes from 2 up to infinity of the Riemann zeta function evaluated at n. So I can write that as zeta of n. So I did a previous video where I calculated this sum in this form, but I like how it shows up in this solution here. And that's a good place to stop.